Okay, let's make a start in our um, final panel for the day. Uh, it's really been a fantastic set of panels and wonderful set of questions as well um, from the audience. So I uh, look for, very much forward to the discussion um, that we'll have after uh, hearing from our speakers. Uh, my name is Llewellyn Hughes. I'm a faculty member at the, uh, at the Crawford School uh, here at the ANU. And let me uh, far first begin by acknowledging the, and paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. Uh, this panel uh, focuses on science and technology uh, policy, both uh, basic science and applied. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, three fantastic speakers that we have today who I will uh, introduce for you in, in a moment. Some of you may have noticed that uh, our Minister for, uh, science, uh, for Industry and Science, Ed Husick, uh, gave a speech at the American Chamber of Commerce last month, and he made some really interesting remarks uh, about the direction of uh, Australia's uh, policy in science and technology. Uh, he noted um, that he was, this was in reference to the United States, uh, excited about deepening levels of cooperation between the two countries, I'm paraphrasing his speech here, um, and working to ensure that they partner together on technology collaboration, clean energy transition, and advanced manufacturing. He also said that the energy transition has really profound implications, obviously for the climate uh, and, and future generations, but also for the economic structure of Australia. And particularly he noted that Australia's future success depended on us uh, as a country becoming better at creating value-added products. That is, um, uh, in addition to uh, continuing to provide uh, resources uh, to the world, uh, also um, thinking about how we might build our innovation system and our systems for uh, developing and exporting technologies. Now, the minister made uh, another point, which was with regards to economic complexity in the area of innovation studies. There's a quite an interesting and rel relatively new set of ideas uh, which focus on the importance of economic complexity in national economies for driving long-run economic growth. Right? The idea is that uh, innovation uh, it's most successful when it, it comes from you build on existing capabilities right, within economies. The more uh, capabilities that you have or the greater complexity that you have within an economy, the more potential combinations of new ideas and new products that you can make, which you can then use domestically and export. Uh, there is an index of economic complexity uh, that was developed by one of the people who have, have uh, you know, been the proponents of thinking about this problem, Ricardo Hausmann from the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, and the minister noted that Australia currently stands 93rd out of 133 countries in our economic complexity in index, and that we've also fallen over time relative to many um, other OECD countries. Now, uh, as you all are probably aware, both uh, Australia and Japan have also uh, recently announced net zero strategies, uh, that is committing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by mid-century. And in Japan, this has led to a re-energizing, um, you know, it's hard to avoid that pun, um, uh, of industry policies through the uh, GX or green, uh, uh, green transformation set of policies, which is a multi-sectoral innovation uh, and, and green industry policy. Uh, and the Australian government, you will have seen as well, is also beginning to really seriously think about uh, innovation and green industry policy for the first time uh, in a long time, as, as the minister alluded, uh, alluded to. Now, when we think about uh, industrial strategies uh, and we think about innovation, interdependence is, is crucial. It's not only about uh, national innovation systems, but it's also uh, about the global implications of domestic policies, as we've already seen in the energy space, um, we also know that in a, for a number of te technologies, solar photovoltaics is a key one, uh, innovation systems are global. So, you know, research uh, labs, fabs, uh, which are doing, you know, uh, leading, uh, uh, you know, uh, cutting edge uh, manufacturing can be located outside the home country of the, of, of the countries which are developing those technologies. So international cooperation is really important, and I think that's really what uh, Minister Husik was, was referring to. Now, uh, today we're going to hear from uh, three speakers who are going to give us different perspectives uh, on science and technology. And uh, so let me uh, introduce uh, them to you now briefly. Their bios are all available, as Shiro said, in the booklet. So um, I'll introduce them briefly now, but please do take a look uh, uh, in, at the booklet at your, at your leisure. Uh, first, we're going to hear from uh, Associate Professor Masaru Yadime, 
Professor Yadime is an associate professor in the Division of Public Policy at Hong Kong University for Science and Technology, and he's also an honorary associate professor at University College London and a visiting associate professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. And I feel like we should probably like, get you to be an honorary associate professor at the ANU as well <laughs> at some point. It's really um, terrific that he was able to join us from Hong Kong. He's come down from Hong Kong um, to speak with us. One of a real global leader uh, in um, science, technology and innovation policy, particularly as it focuses on uh, sustainability and energy, and particularly as those relate to um, data, that is, Internet of Things and AI. So we'll hear from Professor Yadime first. Second, we'll hear from Professor Anna Moore, who is a professor of astronomy and also the director of the Australian National University's Institute for Space, uh, in, a, in, in which role she sets the strategy for space-related activities at the ANU, which sounds like a pretty cool job, I have to say. Um, uh, Professor Moore joined us uh, from uh, Caltech uh, and uh, has worked uh, with Japan as well as other uh, uh, astronomy institutes around the world. And third and certainly not least, we'll hear from Takeru uh, Izuhara. Mr. Izuhara uh, is a director at ST Solutions Australia, which is a soft bank company, and he's been working in the IT sector for many years, particularly focused on AI, on robotics, and also on process automation in Singapore, in Japan and in Australia. And I'm happy to announce, some of you may have seen one of these in Japan, uh, that he's been involved in developing the, um, the uh, high-functioning AI robot Pepper. And actually, the hotel that I stay at when I'm in Tokyo sometimes has one of those in the, in the lobby. I always give it a bit of a wave, and it kind of <laughs> waves shyly back at me when I, when I, when I go, in, go in to check my, check my luggage in. So um, the speakers are all coming at the kind of question of science and technology from slightly different angles. We've got space, we've got AI and also Information, uh, we've got sustainability issues. So what we've asked them to do is open uh, with about 15 minutes of remarks each, um, each are using uh, just a, very, a few slides, and then we'll come back together and begin discussions. So let's begin with uh, Professor Yadime. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor Hughes, for your kind introduction. Um, currently, I'm at the Division of Public Policy at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, I used to be based at the University of Tokyo um, for many years, and then I moved to Hong Kong about uh, six and a half years ago. And then uh, I'm now looking at the situation of science and technology from outside the country. I think that gives me a lot of uh, a fresh opportunity to look at the situation of, uh, of uh, Japan. Um, also, um, I'm affiliated with the University of College London. They have also a department uh, particularly focusing on science, technology, engineering, public policy. I think increasingly major universities in science and technology are trying to establish such a kind of unit or institute, trying to look at how science and technology affect all the societal issues like sustainability, economic security, and also international relations. Um, so um, I think it's good to have uh, multiple perspectives to look at uh, these uh, very complex uh, interrelated issues. Oh, okay. Um, so, yes, the science and technology is also a very broad issue, and then there are so many issues we need to discuss. But uh, just as a um, kind of a snapshot of the current situation with regard to science, um, which is represented by uh, publication. Um, so you see, um, the, uh, this is the kind of ranking of countries with regard to the publication of scientific papers published in journals. Um, so US um, has been the leader, and then Japan uh, used to be the second. And then recently, China has very really increased the number of publications. And then the, the latest one, the China uh, is the number one country, and then US the second, and then Japan is in the fifth uh, position even though the absolute number of publication has been increasing, but then that simply other countries are publishing more uh, than, than uh, Japan. Um, so this is the, the kind of situation. There are a lot of other indicators, like uh, the 10% uh, 
top 10% publications or top 1% publications, and then the performance of the pie is not necessarily so good uh, compared with the absolute number of publications. Um, and then we've got the patents, which would be considered as a kind of indicator for technological development. Um, there are a lot of debates about uh, uh, whether we could use patent as an indicator of innovation, because the, the value of patent could be very different depending upon patent one or patent two. But then still, uh, we have a very established database uh, globally, so that it's, it's quite uh, useful. So um, I think still many researchers use uh, patent data. Um, and then um, this is uh, based upon the number of patent families, which means that you, know, the, the, you can apply for patents. Uh, the same patents can be applied for uh, in different countries. Um, so we try to uh, the, the integrate them as just one patent so that we don't count the same patent uh, two times or three times. And then here, uh, Japan uh, has been um, the, the leader uh, in the world with regard to the number of um, uh, patent families, um, even though the other countries, like uh, particularly China, has been increasing uh, the number of publication, uh, the patent applications in recent years, but still somehow Japan uh, maintains the, the, the number of patents here. Yes, um, and then this is the share of patent families by technological fields. And then here, Japan has been uh, quite strong with regard to electrical engineering and also general machinery and then transport equipment. Uh, but compared with them, uh, let's say uh, biomedical devices and biotech are relatively weak. Um, so you can see uh, which country will be relatively strong with regard to the technological fields. And then if you look at the US, then you see the biomedical, biotech, they are very strong. Uh, um, so, compared with, let's say, electrical engineering. And then, the China, the ICT in particular, has been really uh, progressing uh, in recent years. Um, so, in a way, globally speaking, we can see, uh, ideally, we can see a kind of complementarity uh, between different countries, because different strengths are there in different countries. And then, this is just uh, the... Uh, the a figure taken from a uh, WIPO uh, recent report. Uh, this is the share of global electrical patenting uh, by uh, Japan, Korea, and China. So East Asian countries are, are very dominant in this domain. Here, uh, electric patenting includes uh, broadly uh, all this uh, more conventional audiovisual technology, but also telecommunication technology, and also uh, apparatus and energy and IT uh, uh, semiconductors, and also other computer technologies. So it's, it's quite broad category. But then you see, that, well, Japan used to be really most, almost half of the uh, electric patents uh, obtained in the past. But then after that, Korea increased, and then China has also increased. Uh, so in a way, um, Japan has been leading in this domain, but then the, increasingly Korea and then China has been really increasing their patenting activities in this domain. And then, um, yeah, because of the time limitation, uh, I just want to mention um, some of the, uh, uh, the areas which um, somehow I have involved. Um, this is um, uh, some of the research activities I've been working with my colleagues in Tokyo. Uh, um, somehow we try to work on uh, this distributed energy systems uh, with peer-to-peer -peer energy exchange based on blockchain. And this is still uh, very preliminary in the sense that uh, it's not yet uh, scaled up to the mainstream in the energy sector. But then that you could see uh, kind of potential of uh, somehow linking the green transformation and also digital transformation. So these area, two areas are really emphasized by the Japanese government, for example, but also industry as a, a, the, the, the very... Uh, promised, uh, in a way, uh, large expectation with regard to creating markets and then to try to export them to the global uh, market. And then here we see the photovoltaics put on the roof, uh, and then the uh, batteries, and then now EVs are putting into it, and then we can also um, exchange energy. So now the households can become pro producer of energy in to a consumer, so they become a prosumer 
of energy. Um, so this kind of uh, idea of uh, distributed energy systems um, has become particularly important after the experience of the Fukushima uh, the, the, the earthquake and then this, the Fukushima accident in 2011 uh, because of this the, somehow that incident showed vulnerability of the traditional uh, concentrated energy system so that we really need to maintain a more resilient energy supply so that this kind of distributed system could potentially provide a kind of solution to a vulnerability of the more conventional energy system. Um, so, but then we also try to look at the, at the challenges uh, with regard to technological, economic, social, environmental, and institutional issues. And then particularly, uh, we found that uh, institutional dimension, which includes the regulations, policies, and also uh, the issue like privacy and also data security uh, on the standardization. So uh, these kind of issues are probably uh, the, one of the most important uh, challenges we need to address, in addition to purely technological uh, issues. And then um, somehow trying to um, linking this digital transformation and energy transformation, I think the uh, Recently, the Japanese government has really tried to promote the uh, sharing and using data among key stakeholders. So um, one issue uh, here is to how to make a balance uh, between all the concerns like privacy, security on the other hand, and then the promoting data sharing, data exchange, and data, data usage on the other. Um, so there are many different ways to address this challenge with regard to data governance. Um, so for, for example, some of the countries like UK, Canada, and probably maybe Australia, um, kind of the one idea is to establish data trust, which is independent, so that um, somehow you try to maintain a kind of neutrality and also transparency so that uh, the stakeholders can see how our data is collected and then how data is used by whom for what purposes. Um, so creating a kind of independent entity and then ask that entity to, to manage data is one way of looking at uh, dealing with this. And then, um, so in a way it can be understood as a kind of concentrated, uh, centralized system uh, in a particular city or maybe country. And then the Japanese government uh, seems to uh, emphasize a bit different approach in the sense that they try to make it more decentralized in the sense that they create a kind of common data uh, linkage platform, but then that the data is, um, different kinds of databases are owned and managed by different players, different actors, like government or companies or maybe NGOs, and also the applications are provided by different uh, stakeholders, so different companies, or maybe the regional government can play that role. Um, and then try to facilitate the linkages among the uh, data providers and also data users, and then to facilitate the use of data. Um, so I think increasingly, for example, the electric, electricity consumption data, which is traditionally owned by the uh, uh, power companies. And then now, I think the regulation has been just changed recently, and then that other uh, stakeholders can have access to the data so that you can use the data about energy consumption for other purposes. Um, so if you know how energy consumption is, um, is recorded, and then you can see when people are uh, inside the house, for example, and then you can maybe adjust the timing of delivery of other goods and services. Or you can measure the, the health condition of people, particularly elderly people living alone, uh, if there's no change in energy consumption, then you see something happen in, in that household. So then that kind of uh, data usage uh, going beyond its own industry would be also uh, uh, exploring huge opportunities for data usage. And then uh, this is actually my last slide. So what are the areas we can expect collaboration between Japan and Australia. Um, I think one thing I could mention here is what could be called 
critical technology assessment and management. And I think this has become uh, quite important in the context of economic security, as discussed in the previous session. Um, obviously, we need to have uh, information where the, uh, the minerals are coming from, uh, where the, the resources come from, and then how they are processed, and by what means, and then what are the impacts. So I think traditionally, this argument has been made by all the security experts. But then that increasingly, we need to combine that kind of perspective with its environmental assessment or social assessment. So what are the CO2 emissions? Uh, what are the, the use of labor? Uh, what are the, 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 the impact on local communities? Um, so these kind of arguments can be combined with a more conventional approach to economic security, where these uh, materials are coming from. Um, so, in a way, I think th these discussions tend to be discussed in a separate community in the past, where there are very different kinds of people. Right? But then, I think we need to have a kind of more integrated, comprehensive, cri critical technology assessment and management. Um, so, this would be one area which I could imagine that Japan and Australia can work together. And particularly, Australia is very strong with regard to or the minerals and resources, and Japan um, would be very keen to uh, work with Australia uh, scholars and industry, for example, to look at uh, the, how we can assess and then how we can manage all these the opportunities and challenges through uh, our supply chain. So, um, as I mentioned also in, in the previous session, the hydrogen was the one big area. But then that, um, I think. Uh, I think in March, um, the first shipment um, experimentation from Australia to Japan about the, the hydrogen. But this hydrogen is produced by using coal. Right? Well, in a way, if you combine it with uh, a CCS, the carbon storage, uh, carbon capture and storage, then you can theoretically uh, 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 eliminate the CO2 emission. But also, we can think about uh, producing hydrogen from using the uh, renewable energy. Um, so there are many options. So we need to have a kind of a critical assessment. What are the environmental impacts? What are the costs? What are the implications for business? So that um, we don't need to have more detailed information and more critical assessment on that. So on this point, I think Japan and Australia can work together. So this will be also uh, can be applicable to uh, electric vehicles and other uh, batteries. So these are quite important areas now. But then I think we really need to have a more comprehensive critical assessment. And then the second domain which I could mention now is the governance of emerging technologies with stakeholders. Um, so on this, I had mentioned the smart cities in the sense that, as I just mentioned, that data uh, is increasingly available from uh, different devices, different sources from IoT, uh, satellite imaging, and also um, the, the buildings and also automobiles. So how we can manage a lot of data from uh, different sources and then use them to tackle, let's say, urban challenges, including climate change, and also circular economy, and also biodiversity protection. Um, so here, I think, um, in a way, um, Australia uh, has been uh, working on this. Um, uh, in, uh, I'm editing a special uh, collection of papers for Journal Data and Policy, and then that I actually reviewed one paper coming from researchers in Melbourne. And then they are really working on this topic by making kind of experiment by trying to, uh, the citizens engaged in the whole the data governance processes. Um, so this is, uh, I think, increasingly important in the sense that um, let's say um, some other countries, uh, let's say China, is also really pro actively pursuing the smart cities. But then that approach would be uh, uh, quite different. So um, I think on this point, Japan and Australia can work together to somehow propose what to be the appropriate way of uh, designing and implementing and evaluating smart cities, including all the environmental and societal dimensions. And then to make a proposal to, let's say, international standard or a kind of uh, internationally accepted uh, the practice 
so that uh, not, not only just the technical performance, but also we really need to incorporate all the societal dimensions so that we, we try to promote smart cities as um, human-centered and inclusive uh, uh, exercise. So that would be also uh, one thing which I can mention. And then um, increasingly we have uh, the challenge of data governance across the border. So how we can manage trans-border data flow. Um, this has been a big topic, um, particularly I think G20 uh, in Osaka uh, some years ago. Um, the Japanese government proposed this uh, data free flow with trust. And in a way, um, this has become, I think now, a, a very important challenge. And also this year, uh, the Hiroshima G7 summit, and this has been very really, uh, emphasized um, so how we can implement that is a big challenge. So um, I think some of the countries are really now talking about data sovereignty, for example. To not allow data to go beyond the national border or regional border. And some of the ASEAN countries also now some are adopting this kind of approach. But at the same time, I understand ASEAN has kind of regional agreement about data f flow within ASEAN. So how we can manage that? Maybe Japan and Australia can work together to make a kind of uh, well-established framework so that we can allow, we can exchange data across borders so that we can benefit from all the data collectively because increasingly machine learning uh, is based upon how much data you have, uh, good data you have. Um, so in that sense, Japan and Australia can work together to propose all this rulemaking with regard to data governance. And this is also quite important for the AI governance, which is also a very big topic. And this year's Hiroshima Summit, they started the Hiroshima AI process in cooperation with OECD and also GPE, uh, which includes Japan and Australia. Um, so probably we could we could try to promote this the whole agenda of AI governance uh, with transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness. Um, so this will be um, especially important because uh, now there are the fears about AI, AI's existence and existential risk to humans, uh, some of the researchers argue. Um, so we really need to maintain a system with all this uh, transparency and accountability. And also we also need to deal with uh, kind responses to uh, information manipulation, disinformation. So how we can maintain a trustworthy system for AI governance. So um, these are some of the ideas which I have at this moment for Australia-Japan collaboration in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, one of my big worries with AI um, uh, is um, uh, and, and, and risk is that it gets better at creating the algorithms that keep me watching Netflix till all hours of the morning. So. <laughs> um, Anna. I find it really interesting that the three science and technology people come with slides today. <laughs> we were told you can have slides and to us that's all, we better have slides when we come along so we can talk. So... Um, uh, um, I often get asked, uh, what is space? I never get asked, what's astronomy? But I get asked, what do you mean by space? Or people have different ideas of what that word means. And so um, I wanted just to take a few minutes to, to just um, introduce what I think that means and what the community, international community thinks that means. So we're all on the same playing field before we have a conversation in Q&A. So, um, space often, when I talk to, um, to people, when, when I say space, um, they kind of think of um, human exploration. They think of mining on asteroids. They think of, which is awesome and cool, I'm, I'm a scientist. Um, they think of Elon Musk's car going off into space. I ro rose my eyes. Um, but that's what they think of space when I say it. They think of rockets, they think of launch. Um, but that's not what space is today. 
in economically, how much we spend on it, what we do, that, that's not how much we rely on it. So um, it's more like the pictures on the screen. This is really what space, the domain of space, means to us as humanity today. This is what we use it for. So we use it for um, navigation, we use it for communication, we use it for automation, a remote automation, remote communication. We use it for telehealth, um, how do we connect people in remote locations, how do we connect them to hospitals, to doctors to get information, uh, remote education. We use it for earth observation. It's an ultimate laboratory to understand what our planet is doing, how it's changing over time, obviously a big issue right now. Um, there are, it's the easiest way to monitor large areas of ocean, of land, which is very important for Asia Pacific region in particular. Think fishing, legal and legal fishing, think what's happening on the waters, think what's happening um, in terms of climate adaptation, bushfires, sea level rises, sea level rise, all that kind of stuff is monitored from, from space. Um, that kind of data is used in the international courts of law um, when you're talking about changes in um, land use, for example, or illegal land use, often that kind of data is used there. Um, it's used for disaster um, um, services. Um, it's the easiest, cheapest way, sorry to get down to money, but often it is. It's the easiest way to monitor large areas um, of ocean and land to, to be that um, connector, I suppose, to emergencies, um, etc. Um, and of course, it's used pr prolifically in the, mi in the military and um, uh, domain as well. So um, that's what space is to me. That's what space is internationally, and that's what we depend and use it for. If it wasn't here today, if it wasn't here now, if the services were switched off, we would be in a lot of trouble. Um, this recording would not, be, would not be broadcast, for example. That's not the end of the world, but, or maybe it is, I don't know. No, I mean, but that, you see what I mean? It's integrated in everything we do. We don't think about it. We don't think of space that way. Um, so I just wanted to, to get that out a little bit. Um, uh, in, economically, the space services, space activities total in 2022, something about, something like half a trillion dollars um, internationally. Um, uh, Australia, a lot of that is in communications, navigation, services. So think services is paid for via services on the ground. So it's us on the ground that are funding to a large extent most of what we do in space. Um, Australia, from Earth observation data, Australia not really renowned to be an upstream provider of space services, um, spends something like, our government spends something like $2.5 billion a year on Earth observation data. So we, we care about it, um, and that's just, that's just for Earth observation. But a point I wanted to get across today is that the nature of, of what we can do in space is changing, and it's changed um, roughly over the last 10 years due to a rapid reduction in access. It's got a lot cheaper to access space, and infrastructure is everything for space. Um, so it means that um, how we operate in space, what we can do and how we can fund it has turned upside down over the last 10 years. Um, if you look at the uh, SpaceX's influence on the Ukraine war, for example, and communications and how that was able to be adaptable, you're talking about a move from a single large communication satellite to a, a, a swarm's not the right phrase scientifically, but think of it like an organic swarm of smaller, cheaper satellites that if you take one out, you replace it with another, and they're all very organic, I suppose, in that sense. Um, so the nature of what we do, how we do it, is changing, and that's why Australia cared about it five years ago to start their own space agency, because we realized we had a lot to offer, but the nature of how you do that can ch is changed. And countries like Japan, who are just powerhouses in space upstream and activity and exploration, for example, amazing um, effort from, from Japan on the world stage. It also, I think, in its community is reflecting on how space is changing and how it can react to that. Some are doing it better than others. I think Japan's doing pretty well. Um, so, um, uh, um, 
selfish plug for my own institute here at ANU. We started up five years ago in response to the fact that our government wanted to start its own space agency to support uh, a growing space sector. Um, my approach, though, wasn't to pick one technology over another. My approach was to do it the other way around, was to say, we want to solve society's greatest challenges. To do that, we need a multidisciplinary team. Um, a lawyer is just as important as an economist, as important as someone who does food growth, plant growth, water purification, rocket fuel. It didn't matter. And so we have a very broad um, uh, participation in our leadership. Uh, there's about 30 academics, all from different disciplines, and it really lifts the level of conversation. Um, I love being a scientist. I'm very good at it. Um, we're not, we get lost in little tiny tunnels, okay? It's really good to be lifted up to important national uh, conversations and solutions, and that's what a multidisciplinary team does for you. Um, so, um, so three areas we're looking at in Australia are sustainability, space sustainability. This is both how can space help sustainability on the ground, but also how do we, to us, um, because space is so important to be, uh, um, it's, because space is so important to us, we also care about the sustainability of space itself. So we don't want it to get damaged in a way that we can't use it anymore. And space is big, <laughs> to quote Douglas Adams, but there's a very thin layer around the Earth called low Earth orbit. That isn't big, that's very thin. And it's, it's the cheapest access, so all your business cases and commercial space are there. Because it's smallest gravitational potential, it's cheaper to get to. So that's where your commercial business is. But if you start having a lot of debris and satellites and thousands and thousands of constellations, you're going to start running into trouble. So sustainability to us is not just using space to keep us sustainable on the ground, but it's about us making sure that we protect space as well. Uh, space education, uh, this is workforce training, um, in our, especially in Australia. We have a different paradigm to Japan here in that sense with space. We have to educate our people um, into what space means and how they can operate in space. Um, and lastly, something we're very interested in, especially at ANU, is how can we be using um, space as a way to partner across the Asia Pacific to be solving things that we all care about in that region. Space is expensive even with, even with that cheaper access today. It's still not three cents, okay? So um, how can we be par partnering together um, to solve challenges that we have regionally as well? Oh. I don't know what happened there. It stopped. Um, three... Uh, Three initiatives we're looking at. Uh, the first is to do with climate adaptation. Um, bushfires are a big issue in Australia. What we want to do is bring um, some ownership of that problem. We want to bring our scientists and tech technologists to come in, not when the fires have happened, but actually turn that around and say, you know what, if you can figure out where these fires are going to be three months in advance, pre-season, how can you adapt? How can you get everyone together to do something about it so that you can reduce the massive fires that we saw three years ago that are coming again. Um, in, let's not close our eyes, they are coming again. So how do we, as uh, internationally, nationally, do something about that? We're also doing a similar response for water as well, water, um, uh, groundwater measurement, uh, so that we can give towns a heads up um, in advance so that they can change their water usage, for example. I won't go into how, it's very cool. If you like gravity measurements, it's totally cool. But that's how you do it. Um, this is, oh, it hasn't, I'm sorry. Am I pressing the button too much? No, I'm doing it for you. So oh, you man, you should have said that before. I've been pressing the button. <laughs> sorry, I've almost broke the key. Um, another, and I'm just putting these projects up to give you a flavor of what's happening in new space. Um, so space medicine for earthlings. So um, this is a project where, um, you know, during COVID, especially in Australia, we realized that access, to, especially remote communities, to healthcare was a real issue. It's expensive, it's hard for them to do so. 
um, and with aging populations as well, it's a, you know, people want to be at home, you know, for longer now, but how do we provide them the level of healthcare? We heard a little bit about that in the previous talk, actually. Um, so this is a project where actually we're using a space problem, a problem that's in space right now, which is how do we, um, how do we enable the next space travelers who will be selected not by youth and health, but by if they can afford it. How do we protect them going into space if they have previous conditions, or even someone with asthma? Or how can we uh, risk assess if someone can go you know, uh, in a space hop or something like that? Um, so we're modeling using AI and um, um, other techniques. We're trying to model in software the human body or systems within the human body. Um, and combining that with sensors, wearable sensors, being able to, in advance, work out um, uh, how the human body reacts over time and can you pick up conditions. So while the funding for this project is actually about space travel, the real reason we want to do it is because it can be applied here on the ground. So you can think about people being in remote communities or all, any of us getting older, being at home, being able to be monitored um, uh, in a telehealth way um, so that we can feel confident that we can be at home and um, getting elements uh, picked up. Um, and lastly, another COVID, um, uh, COVID crisis, I'm not sure that's the right phrase, but um, something out of COVID that came out was the importance of communications, um, uh, human access to communications, secure communications, and the limitations of radio frequencies to be able to deliver that. So um, a possible, well, a solution to that is to change to using um, optical wavelengths, lasers, in fact, La we, frequencies we can't see with our eyes. This is, oh, it's not shining, uh, but, but um, these aren't frequencies you'd see with your eyes, um, but these are frequencies that you can pack a lot more punch into the wavelength. You can, you can basically transmit a lot more information. Um, you, You'll start to see some of these um, technologies coming out very soon. In Australia, we have projects funded both in Canberra and on the West Coast to be doing the ground segment of these um, new technologies. Why? Because Australia is huge. It has a lot of community who know how to build these things. And also, um, we're mostly cloud-free. And so, um, if you want to do any R&D in quantum communications in the future or downlink Australia, the continent itself has a, it's just a huge um, opportunity. And in fact, we're working with uh, Nikt in Japan to, to do the very same. Um, this is my last slide. So, um, so just coming back to opportunities here, I, I, um, I'm, I'm personally very interested in the application of new space to solving regional issues. Um, and, um, and, and using that to enable, I mean, my sector, Australian sector, to be a, you know, to be a part of that, um, where we're not, we're not um, replicating the wheel. Um, and um, I wanted to touch on a couple of um, projects here that kind of highlight the importance of, sometimes it is important to have ownership of, um, of, of this hardware, of these systems. You're not gonna own all of it, it's, it's, expen it's expensive, but there are crucial times when you do want to uh, be in control of your own assets. The top right picture here, um, during the um, January 22 eruption of the Tonga volcano, um, that seismic shift was enough to rupture all the underwater cables that went into that, the South Pacific, 20 islands in that region. Um, and um, there was a, a University of the South Pacific educational satellite, which was um, repurposed by those 20 islands to be able to provide communication in that region. So that story is just emphasizing a very small investment in space technology, new space technology now, was able to um, provide continued connectivity into that region um, when otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't have had that. And the, the bottom left picture, um, 
recently there was an outage in one of the UK um, Inmarsat satellites, which gives a lot of communication data to agricultural farms and um, automated um, um, ag agritech in the region. Um, in Australia, when that went out, it meant that farmers they, they were no longer able to, uh, their equipment didn't work, the tractors didn't work, they had to go out and, you know, and um, try and do the best that they could. And it was uh, quite a significant loss of income for them. So there are cases, there are many cases where having your own ownership, working in partnership with other regions, with other countries, uh, matters. It matters to have that technology and experience built in-house, as it were to deliver your joint um, desires, as it were. Um, and top left, I just want to finish with, um, so Japan and Australia, I think, are just starting their space sort of collaboration. Um, but our space agency um, uh, aided the JAXA, the Japanese um, space agency, with their landing of the infamous, uh, positively infamous, renowned Hayabusa mission and Hayabusa 2 mission. Um, so JAXA were able to, the Japanese community were able to go to an asteroid, land, take a sample, come back. And um, these things are coming at hypersonic velocities, um, 20, well, probably 20 kilometers per second at that point. They're coming from a long way away. And so having a big target, <laughs> which, which you have a trusted friend you can actually aim for, was very critically important. And so the Australian Space Agency worked with the Woomera, the Woomera site, uh, to be able to um, host that landing uh, back, which was a couple of years ago. Um, so I'd like to hope that uh, the um, given new space and new possibilities and growing issues in the region, um, not even just military, I just mean uh, due to climate change, food migration, um, what's happening on our oceans, etc. It'd be really great if we could be doing more work together. Thank you. Thanks, Anna, and that's uh, a terrific place to leave things to when we move into the Q&A to talk about how that might come about. Uh, Mr. Izara. Uh, last person ne, to be a guest speaker today. So actually, Kaizuka-san was invited in by Ippei-san. Nishiro-san invited me. So Shiro-san is really supportive for me as always. So why not, you know? I want to ne, contribute to your community today. Appreciated your invitation. So first of all, I so want to introduce myself briefly. So as you can see, so my name is Takiro Izahara. So please call me Easy. So Australian friend give me uh, this you know, short nickname. So I like it. So I am born in Gunma Prefecture. Gunma is north of Tokyo. So how many people uh, went to Gunma previously in the past? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think ne, you might know. So there are so many uh, mountains, there are so many snow and hot springs. So indeed, I am a mountain boy. So ne, I went to Tokyo to study at Keio University. And then after my graduation, I worked for IBM Japan. In 2016, I moved to Singapore to work for SoftBank. I lived in Singapore almost five years. And then amid the COVID in 2021, I moved to Australia to set up new office based in Melbourne. So I have two kids. So two of them are going to government government primary school now, so named Glenferry Primary School. So actually, the biggest achievement I did in Australia so far is to be a part of PTC, so Parent Teacher Council. <laughs> I would you know, like to uh, learn about local community as well as to see the gap between Australia and Japan in terms of educational system. So for example, as you know, in Japan, there are plenty of homework ne, from the age of primary school student. But as you know, in Australia, no homework at all. So I you know, had a chat with ne, the principal. The principal said to me, so easy. So don't need you know, any homework for the student because it's the, you know, uh, time for kids, for family to spend together at home after school. Mo so cool, you know? So this is really nice advice for me. Mo social 
activity is the most important in Australia. And then, ma, happy wife and happy life. So this is you know, <laughs> second advice. So I received, I have to follow. Ma, anyway, so I want to introduce my company, what I am doing now. So as you can see, ST Solutions Australia. So SoftBank Technology Solution Australia. We are providing technology as a solution. So main solution are artificial intelligence and robotics. They, unlike ordinary items such as iPad, tablet, mobile phone, the use case of artificial intelligence, the use case of robotics, you, you don't know that. So that's the reason why at the beginning we are providing the use case of artificial intelligence. We are providing the beneficial of robotics. To do so, happy to be more creative, to come up with the use case. They, through our initiative, happy to create further opportunity for everyone. Because we believed technology can help us to solve the problem in the community as well as to take on new challenge. So that's the reason why we want to create new opportunity for everyone. So for example, as you can see, this exam mentioned, we have a paper this July. So we did a project with ACT government, AEDU, and University of Canberra. As you can see, uh, Big Boss, ne, Andrew Barson met the paper in person, ne, greeting the paper together. I want to share several use cases in terms of robotics, humanoid robot named paper we have. So what we are doing in Australia so far. So we did a programming class. So it's really nice, as you know, for kids, especially for STEM engagement. And then we are working with community, so kind of Victorian police, uh, Starlight Children Foundation. So PEPA can be ambassador for them. But of course, human beings as a poli policeman, yeah, they can uh, do exploration what they are doing for the community. But PEPA can do so. If PEPA can do so as their ambassador, well, they can, PEPA can help them to get more attention from the community, especially from the kids. So it's a smarter way, as you can imagine. Also, PEPA is working with several government school, primary school, as an assistant of Italian teacher. We are also worked with RMIT, Monash University, for their Chinese class, as well as for Japanese class. I can see so many potential, because there are so many people, as you know, who are studying Japanese, more appreciated your interest. Of course, we are working with uh, academy, university, as well as corporation. So PEPA you know, can connect to uh, ChatGPT to make them more smarter. They actually, physics and they give me you know, several questions uh, for this session. So what opportunity are there to deepen collaboration between Japan and Australia in science and technologies? You know, I am thinking about this question to ne, put my dedication. Actually, as you can see, so there are so many answers from my side. For example, joint research initiative. More exchange program, technology transfer, public private partnership, startup ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. I hope ne, you <laughs> can make sense, you know, these of question. But ne, as you can see, bottom of this slide, right hand side, uh, by ChatGPT. Well, indeed, I had a chat with ChatGPT so to get this question, uh, to get this answer for these questions. So nowadays, I am always ne, talking to ChatGPT like this. What I want to highlight through this message, indeed, technology is ready. Technology can help us to start further conversation ne, like this topic. Of course, we are not ChatGPT. We need to put our dedication by human beings. What is the difference to move forward? So this is also very, very important. To do so, I put my perspective to come up with several suggestions, so like this. So first of all, uh, try new technology like my service and use it in the local community. For example, ChatGPT, I did. Actually, my son, year five, year, year five at primary school, he you know, can chat 
with ChatGPT. The artificial intelligence, まあ several artificial intelligence is available as you know. For example, computer vision, as you know, the Australian retail company like Kmart and Barnings, they did AI project as a trial last year. But the community argued them to stop the project because they worried about AI. They don't know the benefit, beneficial of AI. That's the reason why they want them to stop the project. I, of course, I accept that. I respect the community. If I can add some my message from technical perspective. Actually, as you know, there are so many CCTV. Over 20 years, actually, literally, we are captured. So in terms of you know, data, of the collection, either by CCTV or AI, it's the same. Despite that, everyone worried about AI because they don't know that. So that's the reason why to understand the community, community by community is different. To understand that, I hope we can work together with community. So for example, in terms of uh, personal security, at the end of year concert at my primary school, my children primary school, at the beginning, principal said, please do not take any photo at all for security issue, private issue, security, private matter. Well, of course, everyone, most of them follow the direction. So in Japan, what is the difference? So in Japan, if I have a child who will graduate from the school today, I am keen to the place, you know, where I can take the photo very, very well. So it's acceptable in Japan. So like this, you know, even if we are doing the same thing, so, uh, you know, community requirement expectation are totally different. So that's the reason why I love, you know, working overseas. So technology itself is the same. So even if when we do the project in Japan, in China, in Singapore, in the US, Technology itself is the same, but you know, community is different. Country by country, requirement expectation, the concern are totally different. Why we are doing technologies with technology? Because we want to help the community. To do so, have to work together to understand them. So this is my suggestion. The second, please respect. Technology, like your body, like your friend. So if you have technology, you are expecting them you know, to do everything. So actually, I am also lazy. I hope my robot can do everything. Instead, you know, cannot do so. Robotics cannot do so. So like your you know, body, when you have new member in your team, you will help them. You will train them, you will provide any procedure to them. And then, once they be adjusted in the environment, they can help you. More like this, you want, ne, I hope everyone can respect the technology. Once technology, robotics be adjusted in the environment, be installed in the environment, they can help us. So please respect the technology like your friend. The number three suggestion. So strengths, ne, let's strengthen our relationship as a friendship uh, together. So actually, when I moved to Australia, well, I can see so many good, uh, good relationships between Australia and Japan as a friendship. So it's really nice. So ne, if, you know, when we look at relationship uh, between, for example, ne, Japan and or US, Japan and China, because because of the economy, because of politics, because of you know defense. But sometimes, so it's working. But sometimes it's not working. To keep on good relationship, sustainability. I hope we can have a good relationship as a friendship. If you help your friend, if you help your family, why not? Without any reasonable reason, want to help them. So like this relationship, we had already had. We want to keep on this good relationship as a friendship. The, as you can see, you know, uh, left hand side. So it was uh, taken in New York City in 1900. So as you can see, you know, there are so many cars. 
with holes on the road, with the holes. But you, when you look at right hand sand, right hand, right hand side, it was taken in New York City in 1913. There is no horse, you know, machine replaced the horse. But indeed, you know, more in the short, in short period, more technology will be changed. So actually, we don't know what kind of technology will be appeared in the future, in near the future, like this photo. So we are in unexpected era ne, at this moment. But if we can use technology, they can help us. How we can do so? To maximize the utilization of technology, what we need. So this is my last message. Thank you so much. Last message. So actually, how to do so? Ne, from my understanding, my as my opinion, we need a big picture, you know? What country we want to become? So what kind of relationship we want to keep on together? So like this big picture, we need it to design, you know, install the installation plan to design how to use new technologies. They actually, so far, ne, I put my suggestion from a technical perspective, but today, not for technology session alone. So it's for Australia and Japan. So this is my final message for today. So actually, as I mentioned, there are so many good relationships. And then there are so many sister cities. So between Australia and Japan, as you know, I think 107 sister cities we have. But of course, ne, uh, like my, can, my hometown, most of the sister cities are not in you know, like Tokyo, metropolitan, most of them are in countryside, like my cities. So they have so many problems you know, getting older, as you know, but not only in Japan, but also in Australia too. To help them, I want to share, want to share two projects with you all. So first project, so led by the Japanese government. So Digital Garden City Nation, Digital Day and Toshi are in Japanese. I think you might know. So ne, Tokyo again, so they have a lot, they have everything. Tokyo is really convenient. But unlike Tokyo, countryside is not convenient. But like my home country, hometown. But I love hometown, but anyway. Ne, to, you know, Japanese government want to, want to make rural area more convenient through digital capability. So it's the strategy, it's the vision, named Digital Garden City Nation. They, to achieve this goal, they are focusing on Web 3.0, decentralized autonomous organization, NFT, non-fungible token. They want to share second project with you, so Yamakoshi uh, DAO project. I think some of you might know Yamakoshi, which is in Niigata Prefecture. So actually, they have, you know, the number of residential in Yamakoshi, just 800, 800 people are living there, just 800. So if, you know, they do not do anything, ne, but they will well, get to die, unfortunately. But, you know, they do so many things ne, with NFT. So they are creating, you know, NFT named Nishi, Kigoi NFT, and then they distributed this NFT to real residents free of charge first. And then they are asking so many people, you know, who want to buy this NFT. Upon the person buy this NFT, they are eligible to be a digital residents. You know, both real residents and real, uh, real residents and digital residents working together to plan the coming festival, Matsuri, what kind of activity they will do to draw the attention out of the community, what kind of budget they will secure toward the next financial year. Budget is very important. And then, if the person do some contribution as voluntary, you know, they will give them NFT as an award, good system to encourage the community. And then, they will talking together on the DAO community. Despite where they are living, they can talk together, they can work together. I think this concept we can defer to keep on good relationship 
as a, as, as a sister city because they have already had so many good relationships to keep on this good relationship to the future for next generation don't need to be physically. We can communicate together digitally, virtually. Of course, hybrid is also important. But like this technology, we can refer to. Thank you so much. Okay, so I feel like the first thing I need to say is if there are any ANU students still here uh, who might be in one of my classes, please don't submit an assignment uh, that says by chat GTP 3.5 or indeed 4.0 um, for them. Uh, although they, it's true, they do give a general sense of the direction to go. It becomes difficult as a faculty member to set good assignments. Uh, so we've got about 20 minutes uh, for questions. I'm just going to lead off with a couple and then open the floor just to kind of get things, uh, get things moving. And I wanted to start with you. You made a really interesting um, comment uh, about Australia's space agency and Japan, uh, you know, really at an entry point of beginning to collaborate more together on a bilateral basis. And so I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit more about how that's happening. Uh, and you know, and what direction you think it's going to go in? I was particularly really interested in the comment that you made that because of the economics of space have really changed. That you've got a whole new set of actors coming in, commercial actors primarily, as well as changes in technologies. You know, it's like miniaturisation and small satellites getting put up and all those kind of things. So, um, you know, presumably that would have an effect on the, the stakeholders or the actors involved in international collaboration as well. So, some thoughts along those lines, if you could. Yeah, um, that's a lot to unpack. But <laughs> um, so um, uh, so my experience over about twenty years working with Jap with Japanese colleagues and institutions on astronomy um, uh, was amazing. And if I could if I could just copy paste that into space, um, I, I'm going to retire really well. Um, so, um, but space is not space is not astronomy. Um, so. Um, um, I th so, whereas Japan and Australia are hyper-aligned on what is on astronomy and what that means, and astronomy is a discipline. It's a it's a small discipline in physics, which is another discipline. Space is a domain, so then you can't compare the two of them at all, really. Um, but whereas Japan and Australia are, and internationally, people are aligned on what what are the big challenges in astronomy? What are the top three things we want to do? We all agree on it. We all go behind closed doors. We fight in, you know, on what those three things are. But when we come out as a community, the astronomy community, we know exactly what they are. And we know how we achieve them. And it makes our story, it lifts the game, and it makes our story much cleaner, I suppose you could say. And it means that we can work very well together. Um, I loved work. I still love working with, with my colleagues in Japan. Um, it's very high quality, very similar um, attitudes to contracting and things. It's like, it'll be all right, mate. Uh, you know, and um, so we've, yeah, it, I wasn't expecting that when I first started 20 years ago. But for, um, but space is very different and the maturity of our two countries with regards to upstream space in particular are, are very, very different. And one of the biggest challenges in Australia is is to um, uh, to for people to, to I suppose educate uh, the government um, advisors and, and ministers on what space means, and that's the level we're at right now. Um, and I'd say we've gone a little bit backwards in five years. So I don't want to start so negative. That's yeah. I'm usually not a negative person, but I'm just very practical. And so we've kind of gone back a little bit on what does that word mean, you know? And so in Australia and the Australian community, we we have a little bit of work cut out to be bringing it back to actually space is not about just rockets and just this and just that. It's actually very important to our way of life. We're already spending a lot of money on it, um, and. Um, yeah, so that's that's the first difference. Whereas in in Japan, their story is so bright. And certainly, as an external person, it's such a success story. It's intertwined with, I suppose, national pride. Certainly on the international stage, and their achievements are just just spectacular. So we have a big difference there. Um, but that being said, we're starting to see more projects where we're coming together in a complementary way. And um, so the Hayabusa one was just the start of that. But I think in areas like quantum 
I'll pick quantum communications um, as one of them. So Australia brings a lot of positives, a lot of necessary components to a world where we want to be uh, connecting quantum computers as the next internet, right? So for example, so we bring a lot of um, positives to that table and one of them being the, the um, ground infrastructure that you need to, to create this new internet of the future, right? So, um, and that's hard to do from a smaller country. So um, that's something we can bring to the table regionally in a story that we all need to work together on to get happening because it's, um, it's, it's so big. And so I think in areas like, like that, you don't start with the word space, you start with the, the, um, the, the quant in this case, quantum communications, how do you join quantum com computers up? Everyone talks about computing as being the only problem. Okay, but no one talks about how you connect two computers up, right? That's not easy, two quantum computers, right? So, um, so how do you actually do that? Well, space does play a big role there, and it's something that Australia can bring to the table, and we can be working with Japan on things like that. So we're starting to have those conversations. Uh, disaster management is another one, for example. Um, meteorology is a, is a big one too, so Japan have um, very sophisticated assets in space. Um, how can we improve their bandwidth by using optical communications, for example? So trying to build on the stuff that we're really good at individually already and then bring it together to, to solve something which is bigger than the sum of its parts, I suppose is the right way to start. Yeah, fantastic. It's, you know, I mean, I work in the, in the um, en energy space and, you know, often the bilateral economic relationship is talked about one that's highly complementary because we've got a, a lot of resources which help have helped fuel Japan's economic growth for decades. But it is interesting, you know, if you, as you look across different sectors, as you've just done now as well in, in this area, that there are really substantial complementarities that exist in, in other areas as well, right? We very really focus on the natural resource piece but in other areas as well. As you were saying before, you know, even lack of cloud cover, I sort of feel like being a big country like Australia is, it's just got some inherent advantages that can be lead to collaboration opportunities as you were, you were describing. Um, uh, so, uh, Professor Yanima, I wanted to ask you about smart cities. Uh, and so, it, it kind of, I remember this, I don't know if anyone here remembers the multifunction polis from 1987 Hawke regime, <laughs> uh, government I mean, remember that? Um, it was a, an idea, a METI-driven idea um, about building a, city in, in Japan, but I, I wanted to come at the issue of smart cities from a slightly different angle. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, in, the, in your initial remarks, and often when we think about uh, greater collaboration, let's say, in energy transition, we think about it on a supply chain basis, right? So that is, is Australia going to move up the value chain in, in battery manufacturing, right? Or in, in green steel, are we going to start, um, you know, moving up the value chain? Um, and smart city is really interesting because it's, it involves a lot of amalgamation or integration of multiple supply chains. It's a really quite complicated picture that's a struggle to do within a particular country. And, and so how international collaboration would happen between countries using a concept like smart cities is a, is a complicated thing to think about. Like, would one to do that at a bilateral government to government level or at an industry level? Or would you think about carving off particular parts of the, uh, of the kind of smart city concept and, and, and pushing collaboration within that? How, what do you, how do you think you would progress something like that? Um, thank you very much. Um, that's a very important question. Um, yeah, I'm actually looking for an um, answer to um, that kind of question with my uh, students and, and colleagues. Um, um, yes, so in a way, I think the idea of innovation has been also changing in the sense that traditionally we just talk about R&D investment, um, which is very important, obviously, in the case of uh, the semiconductor and others. But then the increasingly the technologies are used in an actual context like cities, and then try to learn by using it and then making mistakes, and then try to learn and then change it and then to improve it and then use it and then get feedback. And so this kind of um, innovation is also getting quite important. And then in the case of smart cities, you have many stakeholders from different sectors uh, which are not traditionally connected with each other. But then that now we are getting connected, like transportation, buildings, land use, and the energy and others. So um, that gives actually a big challenge to traditional Japanese companies, for example. When I talk with com people in the companies, they say that, well, you Usually they talk with uh, their just suppliers. Uh, they have relationships and then 
they know what they, they want. But then that increasingly they need to talk with companies in different sectors, and also they need to talk with local government, and then they need to talk with the citizens. Um, so um, that requires, um, I think, different kinds of skills and knowledge. And, and also they need to test these technologies on the ground by actually inviting users to use and then to get, get, get feedback from them. Um, so I think in that context, um, we could think about, let's say, creating, uh, you know, a kind of uh, uh, living, living laboratories together. Also, uh, international regulatory sandboxes, in a sense that as we uh, discussed that there are so many challenges like privacy issue, data security, others, um, and we don't know how to solve these questions. So we just want to create a space together and then to test these advanced technologies, maybe quantum uh, communication might be also AI, IoT, blockchain, these are somehow, we don't know how to govern these technologies. So, um, so in that sense, we create a space together and then test it together and then learn together. Um, so that kind of opportunities might be a uh, possibility for uh, collaboration internationally. So I think in a way, I think Japan somehow tried to do that in uh, ASEAN country like Thailand, uh, for example, creating smart city and then inviting uh, also local companies and then to do it. Uh, but then that we, we could obviously do it with Australia or other countries and then try to uh, demonstrate that what are the issues, what the problems, and then we, we share the problems together and then to learn. And then hopefully by by doing so earlier, then we can also propose regulations, policies, in a way, creating a kind of standard. So that would be um, something we could, we could explore in the future. That's very interesting. I want to um, move to questions from the floor, um, but I did want to acknowledge, Ms. Lee, the interesting idea that you have around using sister city relationships as they exist in order to, to use as a, a potential platform for furthering collaboration between the two countries. That's an interesting idea because often we think about, you know, science agencies or, um, you know, ministries which have got science sitting within the portfolio as the key locus mm -hmm. through which you might see collaboration happening, but particularly as as Professor Yarime said, if you know, uh, feed, user feedback becomes an important part of actually the innovation process, then the kind of engagements that you, you've described are, you know, is a very, very interesting idea. And it's great to see you engaging locally um, already as a, as a company. Uh, we've got um, about uh, 10 uh, minutes, and I, I want to open the floor up uh, to questions. I can see a hand waving up the back here, so let's begin here. There's a mic that will be coming to you. If you could just um, just let us know uh, your name and affiliation, please. Thanks. And also who you address the question to. Anita Burns. I'm from AJS New South Wales, among other things. Um, I worked in technology in Japan, and I just see that um, the government's established, uh, the Japanese government's established a digital agency um, for, I think, for more digital government to promote that anyway. Um, I'm curious about how that's going, how the two, um, uh, Yarime Sensei and um, Izuhara-san, think what they think about that and about uh, probably SoftBank doesn't need that um, help perhaps, but uh, how they see that and whether that's something that Australia should be emulating. So, Mr. Hatton, do you want to start? Japan's digital agency and your and, and SoftBank's enga <laughs> engagement with that. You can pass if you want. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the question. Actually, honestly, you know, from my bottom of my heart, I need chat GPT to answer the question. <laughs> but anyway, I will try, okay? So, actually, Digital ends, ma, of course, it so depends on the capability of the person to tell the truth, what they are expecting, the digital agency, what kind of technology they want to use. Ma, everyone is different. <laughs> that reason why I need to talk to them. So this is my understanding. And then, so luckily, Japan has so many, ma, actually, population is decreasing, but still have so many population when we compare the rest of the country to Japan. Ne, they can help elder person to be, you know, body to teach them to use new technology. Actually, so this time, so thanks to uh, Shiro-san, I was here, the, I shared, you know, this YouTube uh, with my dad and mom, you know, who are living in Japan. So actually, for them, first time to see live stream. 
So how to, you know, join the live stream? I am helping them, you know, to access the live stream. So everyone, in short, everyone is different, but if the person had a body like myself to talk to my parents, they can, you know, accept the technology to end their life. So this is my answer for your question. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a very important question. Um, probably some of the people here from the Japanese government can answer better than I do. Uh, but uh, just, just a, a reaction to that. Um, so I guess traditionally there's a concern about the data uh, possessed by the government can be used for other purposes, which didn't, uh, uh, which are not really mentioned in advance. Um, so that was actually the case in the case of COVID-19. For example, in the case of, uh, I think of Singapore, they collected a lot of data and then they used uh, some of the data for uh, uh, the, for police investigation, for example, and, and that was not mentioned to the people in advance. So that, that kind of question, uh, issue could, could arise. But then I think now, um, particularly after the COVID-19, um, we, we learned that we really need to use data more effectively and efficiently so that we can, we can, we can uh, eliminate all the, 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 the obstacles and, and barriers um, so that we can provide services more quickly and more accurately. Um, so in a way, the, the challenge is, uh, is that how we can manage data uh, in, in a way that um, people uh, do not necessarily need to have a concern about the data used for different purposes and properly managed and, and with accountability and transparency. So I, I think the, I understand that the Japanese government is, is uh, trying to do that, but there are some issues uh, about uh, uh, for those who are not necessarily familiar with all this uh, digital system, the devices, and they may not be able to use it, and what happened they, 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 when they have lost uh, the cards and, and others. And, but then that probably this is a part of the process we need to, uh, we need to deal with uh, in a way that uh, definitely we, we, we should really try to uh, establish a system that the data can be used uh, uh, for providing services to the people. Thanks. Uh, so uh, let's go elsewhere. Uh, take the gentleman here. Um, <coughs> My name is Joe. Uh, my name is Charles Millward. I run a point of sale software company targeted at the grocery and liquor industry. And <clears throat> like a lot of businessmen, we see AI coming down the tracks at us with great speed. So this is addressed at the two gentlemen who uh, asked, who addressed the issue of AI. Uh, how do you see AI um, evolving in the business community? Do you think it's going to become a very widespread technology and co companies should develop their own uh, AI uh, capability, or do you think it'll become a specialized um, technology which a few uh, sp companies will sell more broadly into, into industry uh, and develop specific expertise? Um, thank you very much. That's a very great question. Um, to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> But then, um, we are, yeah, apparently, uh, obviously, there are some really uh, wonderful big tech companies like Google and, and Amazon and, and these companies. They have a huge uh, large language model, for example, and then simply other companies cannot compete with them because they have, they have resources and expertise. But at the same time, it seems to be that there are many applications and you really need to have a specialized system. So it seems to be there's a kind of division of labor in the sense that some companies are big expertise and technology knowledge, they can really develop uh, large language models with all the parameters. And, but then also you need to have a specialized companies provide, let's say, educational services, health services, energy services, and then they really need to uh, fine tune these systems to their specific applications. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of debate about uh, how to regulate uh, large language models, for example. And then it seems to be big tech companies that now somehow try to argue that when well, the EU, they really try to initially put a large language model or foundation models as a high risk uh, domain so that they could be heavily regulated. But then that uh, they are trying to argue that, well, they can, cannot be uh, responsible for all the applications because they don't know how their models can be used. So in a way that they are trying to argue that, well, regulations should be uh, applied to applications rather than large language models or foundation models, which can be used for many different purposes. Um, so I think um, in different domains that 
there are many uh, expertise, um, and you need to combine AI and domain knowledge. So how to combine them would be probably critical. Um, so uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities actually for startups to focus on particular domains rather than going into this the arms uh, race uh, with the, all the big tech companies. So um, yeah, I, I think th th there should be many opportunities available. But then how to do it would depends upon how you can closely collaborate all the, the, the actors in specific domains and knowledge and experience. And Masaru, if I could just follow up quickly on that. Uh, so your expectation would be then that regulation would be primarily, primarily domain related and primarily national in character. Is there also a kind of international or collaborative perspective associated with regulation? Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, I think that is what is exactly going on at this moment. Um, so, um, yeah, well, uh, in April, I attended um, a meeting uh, by, um, uh, I think organized by World Economic Forum uh, by inviting all the big players uh, in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. And then they, they made a kind of proposal. And then uh, I, uh, I think in, in July, the G7 summit, then they started this uh, uh, Hiroshima process for AI. And then that, uh, I think in November, UK government is going to organize uh, a big event about how to regulate AI. And then I understand that Japanese government is trying to make a proposal for G7 uh, kind of a, a, a plan to how to regulate all these AIs. Um, so internationally speaking, uh, there are a lot of activities going on. But uh, one challenge is that, uh, you know, uh, as I also mentioned, that OECD and the GPA, they are also uh, quite important as hosting all these initiatives. But then, well, probably that China is not involved. So um, I, I learned that the UK is going to invite China for the November meeting, but then I, I don't know how that happens. And in the case of the April meeting, Chinese companies are invited, but then in the end, nobody came to that meeting. So it seems to be the AI governance area, um, a lot of kind of uh, increasing division, uh, as a, like G7 countries and, and affiliated countries, and then uh, and China and Russia and others. And so how we can manage this would be, I think, one of the key challenges in the coming years, because AI affects everyone. Um, so how to establish a kind of common ground or framework so that, uh, in a way, and then we can compete with each other. But then how to manage that would be a big challenge. Very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Yuzaha. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you so much for the question. So as you know, what the need for AI? AI needs the data. So so many data needed for AI. So that's the reason why, like Amazon, like Meta, like Microsoft, as Yarimesan mentioned, big company uh, will be, uh, you know, will be dominant ne, in the AI market because they have a plenty of AI, a data for AI training. So this is my answer for your question. But at the same time, they cannot do everything. So that's the reason why, as he mentioned, so need to think about some specific use case. So for example, of course, ChatGPT is good at English, so rather than uh, Japanese. So to you know, complement the weakness of OpenAI. For example, we are working with OpenAI to deploy the version of Japanese for Japanese market. For example, previously we worked with IBM Japan to deploy the version of Japanese for IBM Watson. So like this specification, everyone needed, despite they are big company like Amazon, Meta, Microsoft. But to answer your question, think about your specification, how, to, how you want to sell your product. So this is my understanding. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. I think that we're out of time and should probably move to um, close, the, close the session now. I'd just ask you to um, thank our speakers for today. It's been a really interesting session. So i am uh, been asked to uh, close uh, the session for today. I'd like to thank 
uh, everybody for um, staying for the day. Uh, it really um, brings home, uh, you know, that, that uh, Australia and Canberra, and particularly the ANU, is a pretty special place when it comes uh, to, uh, you know, Japan-related work. There are not too many places outside Japan where you will have a room full of people, um, uh, you know, for a, for a whole day where we focus on, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, fairly um, technical uh, and also detailed issues that we, we've been able to canvas canvas today. Um, it's a real um, uh, kind of smorgasbord of different issues that we've looked at and we've heard some, from, some, from some fantastic uh, fantastic speakers. Um, for me, there are kind of uh, two or three major takeaways. I mean, obviously, a lot of terrific detail. Um, and, you know, many of our speakers are here, so, you know, you can catch them afterwards, hopefully, uh, as well. Um, firstly, the really significant changes which are going on in the Japanese economy. I was, um, you know, uh, quite struck by that. I said, I, I, you know, I work in the energy and climate space, so I'm, I'm very focused on energy transition and what's happening to, you know, what, what uh, is happening to the energy mix, for example, or how electricity markets are getting redesigned or so on and so forth. And I somehow missed this issue that we might have had a structural shift in which we've got kind of mellow inflation happening across Japan that could, have, could lead to an a, a, a increase in wages over time. It's just kind of a, a world that I you know, don't really remember. I remember the bubble. <laughs> you know, I remember what happened. I remember what happened after the bubble. But uh, that that kind of uh, uh, you know steady uh, you know two percent inflation um, with uh, wages growth um, uh, as well is something that um, that I uh, I was kind of uh, really very very um, very very struck uh, struck by indeed. Um, the the other part of it, I guess, uh, that was very interesting, uh, aside from the macroeconomic picture, was also. Uh, you know, the discussions around changes in industrial structure. So uh, it was, you know, very interesting to hear about this issue of, you know, as was discussed, uh, diversification or reshoring um, or friend shoring, I guess, is another um, set of language uh, that we've heard in and around uh, this, this, this kind of issue. And, you know, in a way, it, it very much links to the panel that we had on foreign policy as well, because that was really about, you know, states reinserting themselves into market in order to manage uncertainties as they see them, right? So There's a whole bunch of geopolitical issues uh, tie, tied in there as well. So I think that, um, you know, doing an update li like this every year is really important. Of course, we would talk about geopolitical changes. You know, um, that was part of the conversation last year. That'll be a part of the conversation next year as well, I'm sure. But within that broad change, uh, you know, structural changes like we've discussed with the economy, there are lots of, uh, you know, smaller dynamics which, which uh, you know, which are, are fluctuating relatively rapidly, right? We heard the discussion uh, of ASEAN, for example, and, and, you know, also from Mike Green about this being the year of implementation when it comes to a whole series of different changes across Japan's uh, defence posture. Um, which, which are, you know, which have been uh, really significant, and Melanie Brock's uh, comments as well um, on ch on thinking about security more broadly and the changes that you're seeing in Japan and also Australia's need to do better were also really um, very, very welcome uh, indeed. The um, last part, if I, you know, we've just heard the session, so uh, it, it it's probably fresh in in your minds. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, that that issue of kind of structural shift, uh, you know, driven in this case by climate um, uh, and, and, you know, government policy once again, um, you know, beginning to shape markets in significant ways in order to change the industrial structures of both Australia and Japan was, was a kind of key theme there. And, you know, my story, you know, as someone who's worked with and in Japan for, you know, really since, since um, the early 90s, you know, is that there are a tremendous uh, array of different opportunities for collaboration, that is, complementarities between Australia and Japan. We often focus on natural resources, but as we heard from space, uh, and also as we think about technology issues, including IT, uh, robotics, and AI, there's really a lot to explore. And, uh, you know, the Australian government uh, now, and, uh, and I think the Japanese government, are also kind of building capacity in, in the area to be able to put themselves in a better position to be able to figure out how to exploit that through collaboration together. So I'm an optimist too. I think Anna said she was an optimist by nature and uh, you know, I'm, op I'm an optimist too. So I think we'll have a, a lot to talk about uh, in next year's update. Let me now um, hand the floor to Ipe to make a few thanks to people who have helped make uh, today possible and then we'll close. Thank you.
So don't worry, two, two concluding remarks are too much. I know that, so I will be very short. And uh, Ludwian already offered a very comprehensive uh, remark, so I, I, I would like to thank, first of all, the, the Shiro. So the, Veronica I, and I started the Japan Update 10 years ago. But the first event is rather easy because it's a new thing. I can get the funding rather easily. But the continuing the 10 years is a significant, significant job. So that it's really thanks to the continuing effort by Shiro Armstrong. So that uh, please uh, support him to continue this event. <laughs> and also, I'd like to thank that there are lots of staffs help this event. So that can you tell? Tess is here. Tess. Tess. Yeah, Tess, uh, Tess, Tess is the boss, and you know? Tess is the engine of, of this event. So she did everything, and uh, also the, her team helped the uh, event uh, quite a lot. Please join me thanking for the student assistance. <laughs> and the last, uh, but not least, uh, for those uh, contributing in the session as a presentation and the discussing, and uh, for all of you uh, to participate in the event uh, in a very active manner. Thank you so much. And as Shiro already mentioned, uh, we have a schedule for next year, so that we usually have this event the first Wednesday in September, so it will be the September 4th, uh, 2024. Keep it in your schedule. <laughs> and uh, it's a way advanced, but they keep it in the schedule. And uh, see you definitely next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>